नमस्ते फ्रैंकली द म्यूजिक वॉज जस्ट टू डीप एंड इट मे टेक टाइम फॉर वर्ड्स टू कम आउट फ्रॉम द साइलेंस वेर इट टू कस बट लेट मी स्टार्ट विथ ग्रैटिट्यूड टू श्री रोबिंदो एंड द मदर हु हैव गिवेन अ लाइट विच ऑन द वन साइड लीड्स अस टू द फ्यूचर and not just a future luminous future in the world as it is where everybody is speaking about doomsday and a bleak future here is not just a beacon of light but a lighthouse the sunlight if i may say so which shows that beyond the night there is this beautiful dawn not just waiting for us it's already come and all that we need is to open the curtains of the windows and we shall be able to feel its pulsations in our heart in our mind in our life itself so gratitude to them and this light also throws uh, you know this is a all encompassing light it not only shows us the future shows us the present crisis and how humanity should steer through it and then this light reveals to us uh, the documents of the past and what they really mean and when shubindu speaks of these documents of the past it seems that he is reliving what he has already experienced in a particular age there's a beautiful line from savitri which comes to my mind an archivist of the symbols of the beyond he bore the stamp of mighty memories and uh, this is what i feel when i read mother and shobindo on these various subjects that they are not just uh, interpreting something not even in the light of their experience which has gone way beyond the traditional um, uh you know limits of spiritual experience but something which they uh, which they brought together she remembers i remember one of the um, stories when mother was watching a film i think it was uh, on rani lakshmi bai and she said this is not how it happened and at another time when she was uh, you know she went to a palace and she saw and suddenly she said this is not how it is the way they describe it so when shurvindo describes about the mahabharata uh, you can clearly see that this is not just a historical way of revealing things but things which are self revealed and here a new aspect of shurvindo comes in which we have hardly touched in all his standard biographies we have so many um, aspects of shurvindo but nowhere we see shurvindo the historian now shubindu the historian is not uh, just telling us outer facts and figures but the deeper import of history and he's not just indian history mind you he speaks about western history he speaks about you know ancient the way tribes came together they join and he makes such a beautiful comparative study of history so let's come with that to the uh, issue of mahabharat once again salutations to mahabharati mother india for opening so many doors to spiritual life and this is something so wonderful that uh, um i mean every path she has opened look at the vedas and the upanishad so those endured with a kind of intuitive spiritual sense a kind of intellectual uh, mind which is ready to receive higher light uh, take that route the vedas and the upanishad but there are those who have a heart of bhakti the religious sense so you have the puranas those who want to understand the technology of the cosmos <laughs> so you have the tantras everything leading you towards the one and for those who want to um, understand spirituality in flesh and blood so it's okay that okay this is what the vedas tell us this is what the upanishad tell us and this is how it should be all things which are beautiful and high and true but we want to know how is it in terms of real life because that's the ultimate uh, hallmark of uh, true spiritual living so we have the ramayana and the mahabharata so ramayana and the mahabharata are not just uh, they are known as itihasa and itihas literally means itihas so it happened so there is a story around which the legend you may call it a story a real story around which the whole superstructure has been developed so there is a nucleus itihas but why these epics have continued to endure is one is because they have sprung from the soul of a nation uh, that's how all true epic must spring and it has sprung from the soul of a nation shobindo even says it is not 
one person of you persons who have written mahabharata it is the soul of india which has written, written mahabharata its peoples the story of its people its life its culture its tradition all that is embodied here so again it's not just history in the sense of just the war and what happened in a epoch of time but how were people lived how they conceived life how they connected with it all the various aspects and dimensions in real time that's what we see uh, in ramayana and the mahabharata of course there is a little difference because ramayana describes the both are tales of evolutionary crisis when humanity is going through a moment of evolutionary crisis but the difference is that ramayana is in a early humanity which is flush with the sense of divinity very intuitive when we look at the early stage of humanity when the mind does not come in to rope in and change things it still lives in its pristine purity simplicity the moods are so much direct and still you know when valmiki describes these emotions he lifts them to such sublimity colors them it's like a uh, ocean of feelings which is flowing and taking different shapes shades forms it's amazing and every character is taken to a zenith for instance uh, we have the ravana so ravana is uh, you know you, you won't find another uh, what we we may call as devan <laughs> in the whole history of devanood as ravana in every which way he exceeds on every dimension this titan but equally when we look at rama you can't find another character like ravana uh, rama in ram in every aspect of life again he exceeds in every way we can imagine so does sita and you know that way it's a story when humanity is still in its uh, more animal rakshasic asuric stage and ram brings it the light of uh, reason and illumin illumination to take it further but since the subject today is mahabharata in mahabharata we see a different style though that again there is the evolutionary issue there is the um, common theme in all indian epics primarily uh, in the way indian india indian mind understood morality or dharma is they saw in this creation a battle between the forces of darkness and light this is germane to indian thought one of the things which we find in the vedas in the puranas in countless legends and we always understood life as these two forces one which want to disintegrate and another which want to integrate take things up and human beings had to make a choice nations had to make a choice kingdoms had to make a choice uh, especially when um, things stood at an evolutionary crisis so we see again in vyas its style is very different it's very direct mighty strong um it, but its intensity is subdued when we read the ramayana the intensity carries you are almost carried away by the intensity but mahabharata doesn't give that kind of feel mahabharata rather gives absorbs you in the scenes and the substance that is going through it's like you are watching a movie and you are just uh, enjoying it ramayana you are you are experiencing the emotions that are taking place in the heart of the subjects so there is a little difference uh, vyas is much more direct much more straight much more simple he doesn't if if i use a uh, more modern uh, terminology he doesn't means words so you know he does he's not ornamental that way uh, but he conveys his point with a great strength with a great power so this is what the mahabharata is again a story of evolutionary crisis when humanity has to choose a way uh, one of the two one is of course the way of dharma and the other is the way of adharma uh, if it chooses the way of adharma it is bound to take evolutionary impulsion in creation of which human beings are the highest at this point of time catalyst uh, centuries backward or if it follows that upward earth it will take leaps and bounds so uh, here is the story where we see that there are two forces which are constantly acting uh, indian thought understood it so well and we'll see how relevant it is in today's times so there is in the formation of a nation actually even in the world but let's take because especially the indian nation we have seen these forces act with great intensity and one is the centripetal force and the other is the centrifugal so centripetal force is those we want to build an empire akhand bharat so that's how we see that you know there is there is a tendency in india to build a unified uh, not a uniform but a unified congree of nations india is a subcontinent there were many small little not just tribes but kingdoms to weave them together because they are tied by a common cultural bond and to create a land of dharma so there is the centripetal force and on the other side there are small 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 little nations or kingdoms which want to break away the centripetal force so this we see in 
not only in Mahabharata, we see it much earlier. For instance, in the as early as Parshuram, now we all know the story. But if we really look at it, um, even in fact, um, he is one of the earliest one. We see that higher kingdom had almost created an empire, huge empire, and very brilliant warriors, including this man who ultimately killed Rishi Jamdagni, father of Parshuram. Uh, there, you know, that's where the Kshatriya impulse went wrong and it became very uh, arrogant. But before that, um, Kartvid Jarjun is a, you know, man who is trying to create an empire based on dharma. But then, well, he slips, whatever, that's the rest is history. And during that time, Parshuram slays all the Kshatriyas uh, which he could find in any pocket. <laughs> because he said, no, this arrogance uh, doesn't go with his conception of what dharma should be. So it's a very amazing tale. And uh, then comes this lineage of, there is simultaneously a lineage of Ikshvaku kings. They are the first ones who have created real empires. So one of them is Bhagirath. Bhagirath of the fame of uh, Ganges Avtar. And he also created an empire, an empire based on dharma. There is another king, Mandhata. He also created an empire. All of them are Raghukul Rith, Sadachal Yai, Pranajaya, Parvachan Najai. They all belong to the great clan of Raghu, immortalized in works of Kalidas, Raghuansham. The So they were the ones who tried to build an empire. And uh, they succeeded. For If you look at uh, Ram's journey from all the way from Ayudhya to Lanka. And why do they want to build an empire? It's very interesting. This empire is not built for just aggrandizing oneself or gathering the resources and looting and plundering. Not at all. We see as early as Ramayana, look at the nobility of the emperor. I mean, uh, Lord Ram has conquered. But nowhere he proclaims that I am the king. He says, I am acting on behalf of Bharat. And wherever he has conquered, he coronates the uh, local uh, tribal chieftain as the king. So Vibhishan becomes the king in Lanka. Um, Sukri becomes the king in Kishkinda. Though he has gone through and they have either through pact or conquest, uh, all of them. So it was a congree of nations. Empires in the Indian context never meant uh, destroying the life of the conquered. So one of the things about the Aryan civilization is that it does conquer, but it ennobles what it conquers. So in the Asuric um, way of life, it brings in the uh, idea of dharma and then leaves them free in their own way to develop it, to follow it. And, you know, uh, so this is something which we find as early as the time of Lord Ram. And we also find there a very interesting idea of the king. So, you know, it is again very relevant in today's times also. So, who is the king in the Indian context? No, he is not a depot. So, king is largely, if we look at it closely, he doesn't uh, lift his arm and say, my word is uh, final. Nowhere, you see, there is the king who has the final word. But there is the assembly of chieftains, the warlords, and he must consult them. This is just like the ancient Greeks. Uh, you know, Shivindos Ilion, you see the book of assembly in, in Mahabharata, the Sabha Parv. So, Dhritarashtra calls all the chieftains and they will give their ideas, viewpoint. He will listen to all of them. Final decision he will take is like our in president. So, he takes the final decision. But it is always with the council of minister. And then there is the voice of the people. So, all these three things have always gone together, the Janpads. So, this is how Indian... Uh, confederation has evolved and it's important to understand because it has its rootings now also. Now when we look at Mahabharata time, we see that there are three uh, types of uh, forces which are acting or three types of kingdoms. So one is the kingdom which are going toward the east, northern and eastern side. So uh, you have among them, I think Kaushal is kingdom, Magadh is a great empire, Jarasand, and uh, then you have Chedi, uh, Sishupal's empire, and all these kingdoms and further if we go we have Mats and then there are western and southern kingdoms and then there are central kingdoms. So central kingdoms are very powerful, Bhoj and um, you know some of them come from the lineage of Ikshvaku. So when they align during the Mahabharata war and Sri uses it to explain that the war has really happened and he uses a very different approach to the whole thing. Because people often say there was no war, it's all symbolic, whether it was actually written or not written, all these controversies. Shubhinder says, if a war really happened, then in the whole storyline, the causes of war must be evident. What led to the war? And then he analyzes how beautifully Vyas has presented the political scenario. 
So the there were there were this tendency to form empires, as we have seen Ikshvaku clan, Haya dynasty, and then the latest was Kuru Empire. Now these empires were important because if the empires are not important at that point of time, you will have the centripetal forces and there will be no nation unit. So nation is like a Yagyavedi, a land where a certain group, uh, group life, which is of course varied, stratified, heterogeneous, but it evolves a certain way of life. That, that's a nation soul is meant to be. So we see that during the Mahabharata time, you have these uh, three types of one. One are those who are siding with Duryodhana. Right, very interesting people who are siding with Duryodhana are from the west, right, going up to Kandahar, Gandhar. And uh, you go further south. Now, these people in the southern states, including, um, you know, Shalya, who actually is a relative of the Pandavas, but he doesn't side with them. And what a astute political statesman, uh, not statesman, but political analyst Vyas is. Now, why, why they are siding with uh, Duryodhan? Uh, of course, we have a very picturesque story built around it. But simply because these regions wanted autonomy and they wanted a weak king. <laughs> Look at, put it in modern context and see what are the forces which want weak center. Precisely those who want to be free and autonomous. They don't want any central authority. So you will see even today, there are people who are siding with a weak center. They want a weak center. They want a weak center which is all the time appeasing. Because this way they have their, by autonomy means, they will do whatever they feel like doing. So these are the people who sided with Duryodhana. Because they knew, and it's interesting, Gandhari also points this out. Gandhari says that my son, he may win the war, but he is not worthy of being a Chakravarti Samrat because he won't be able to hold the kingdom uh, more than, you know, uh, for, for maybe a lot less than half a century. So they are siding, standing behind him. They want Duryodhana to be king. Why? Because they are not interested in Duryodhana. They want their autonomy. This is the one part. Then in Bengal, you have on the further side of the Angadesh. Angadesh goes further in the east. That we know is a bought over whole story. But then there are others who have a uh, axe to grind against the Kuru Empire. Why? Because Kuru Empire is the last which has come. So all the certain clans which were eyeing on becoming an emperor themselves, they have an axe to grind. So we see that Jarasand and um, Chedi. The, the Magad and Chedi Empire, though Krishna has got them killed, yet they join forces with Pandavas. It's very interesting. Same we see with Drupad and, you know, uh, uh, of course, Mats Naresh, Virat and um, the Panchals, they go with, um, with Pandavas. But it's very interesting that uh, Chedi and Magad Empire, these two empires, their kings were actually killed. Sishupal by Sri Krishna in the Rajshu Yag. And we see that Magad Emperor Jarasandh is killed. Uh, Sri Krishna gets him killed. Because he, right from the beginning, we understand what Krishna's work was. He was trying to build a nation against heavy odds. And he knew that these, each of them has the ambition to become an emperor. And they are capable. Jarasandh was a very, very strong and mighty king. And he had, he looked after his subjects quite well, regardless of, you know, uh, whatever his uh, tendencies were. And so also with Shishupal, Bhurishrava, all these people wanted to have an empire. And they knew that their challenge is against the Kuru, Kuru clan. And if they came together, they could probably defeat the Kuru. This is the ambition they were holding. <laughs> so, when their kings go away, they still side with Pandava. Because they want to see the Kuru kingdom defeated. At least they will have a share in the empire. So we have this, this clan. And then there is Koshalas, the Koshal and Bhoj and, you know, um, uh, Panchal especially. Now they stand, uh, Mats, uh, they, they stand solid because they have tasted particularly, they, some of them belong to the lineage of um, Ikshvaku, Koshal, Mats, they. So they have they know what an empire is so they want an empire they don't want a weak um, united india they want india to be i mean i am using the term which is more modern but aryavart bharatvarsh to be strong united because they understand that that is what will make everybody prosperous and happy so the way vyas analyzes and how she krishna has seen that entire geopolitical scenario is something which is a you know i think it's it's worth a thesis that how he analyzed and how he went about 
creating a nation based on dharma so he starts with the rajasu yagya of uh, yudhishthir and we see how vyas described you know it's very interesting vyas always stops short of the uh, you know he the, his characters are also superhuman but he still he keeps them within the range of humanity he will not let them exceed a point see ram is evidently superhuman when he uh, fights it's impossible i mean who who is this warrior who can shake all the uh, that's what even mandodri says when she uh, comes to meet ram after ravana has died and she says i am sorry i have uh, i had no choice but to uh, i am the aparadhi i have killed your husband i am the one he says no 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 that's not what i have come i have come to see who is this man so great that he could kill my uh, kill my husband who had conquered all the three worlds <laughs> who could be so great so when you look at ram he is beyond anything you can imagine you won't find such characters in mahabharata bhishma is great he has ikshamrityu uh, trained by parshuram all that is good they have celestial weapons but none of them which goes beyond he stops short he subdues them because the crisis is not the earlier crisis of humanity but when humanity is already there and it has developed all kinds of weapons equipment and now it has to choose a particular path and one of the works of shri krishna was to establish a nation you see when rama came he established aryavart out of jambudweep it was a jambudweep known as jambudweep because you know it had water on three sides then or also uh three dweeps um, you know that's how it was also known as and uh, that's where the term dravid came which has been so much distorted dravid literally means drav this surrounded by water on three side this is what the name means and it has been made, turned into a you know it referred to india <laughs> it has been turned into a very a different kind of a um, uh, what shall i say the divide to create a divide between the indian people all through there was a single culture single culture indian culture is in its single it is many hued and many colored but that's a different subject altogether so we see that uh, one of the work of shri krishna which goes unnoticed because on one side we see him as a uh, super miraculous figure in bhagavat um, in mahabharata he is not described like that nowhere there is only one place now you can feel that vyas is portraying him as if he it is understood that he is he is you know he is uh, he is a godhead but it's nowhere mentioned vyas doesn't bring it out he leaves it to us but he portrays him as the one who is the center of everything so that's why these people uh, shishupal has a problem with krishna because he knows behind rajasu yagya it is krishna bhuri shrava has a problem with krishna because he knows that behind the building of this empire it is krishna and of course we shouldn't forget the yadavas because they, these were the three main empire the magad the kuru and the yadavas so yadavas were very you know they were um, very valiant warriors mighty uh, but they were in in a certain sense confused about what side they should take because if you see they are they after the chandravanshi suryavanshis and the chandravanshis are coming to a halt then we see the yadavas are taking uh, you know predominance so the yadav cla- clan the the yadukul it, it was a divided house in its own right they didn't know which way to go fully and in yudhist in the house of dhritarashtra we see that there are these two kinds of that's again a very divided house why because the elder the elders they want to remain with dharma so we have dhritarashtra uh, we have bhishma and um kripachare and of course uh, drona who wants to vidur they all want to go with dharma so you know but yet very strangely they end up taking sides with the with duryodhana and shrivindu gives a very different understanding to this he says ki basically they were strongly attached to the idea of kuru empire so they knew that dharma is with pandavas but right now the empire is kuru so they are also that way kuru after all in the larger context we call them pandavas because they are son of pandu but they are also belong to the same kuru clan but after much thought why bhishma and dron don't side with them they could have done that because they see behind them the panchals and the mats and therefore 
they feel that if the Pandavas win, Kuru empire will be threatened because it will be basically the Panchals and Mats Naresh will rule. So the way he analyzes the situation, if we apply today to modern India, you know, when Sri said that, um, I don't know why they keep painting me as a philosopher, not exact words, but uh, I have the politician and the poet in me. And you understand what he means by politics. Politics is not about just, you know, uh, power, not at all. It's about, it's an instrument for the divine to create a land of dharma, a group of people who can be guided by dharma. There is no other. Individual can be guided by his own inner uh, development. But how do you govern a group of people according to dharma? So the whole dilemma of Sri Krishna is how to establish a kingdom of, which is based on dharma. So he starts removing these ambitious kings. Jarasand is the first one to take the toll. Then of course Sishupal has already been eliminated. Then come these entire, you know, from Jaidra, then um, all this Kandahar, all those uh, Sindhu Desh. So Sindhu Desh is modern Pakistan and Kandahar is Afghanistan. So India was extending all this. So this is my answer to, you know, when uh, Chinese say that, you know, this belonged to us. So I say, we start saying that <laughs> from Afghanistan, it all belonged to us. <laughs> I mean, this is documented, this is all in history. Even if you Google search the map of ancient Min India, you will see all these kingdoms mapped out. And they were following the common culture. I mean, Gandhari is a Shiva Bhakt. It doesn't matter that, you know, Shakuni was a... Uh, that is okay. Uh, good and bad people exist. But the culture was the same. It was not a different culture. So we see that in this, uh, Shri Krishna, uh, you know, keeps a vigil over because Aryavarth has gone into all these uh, different, different uh, areas. There are different kingdoms. And each is now trying to build an empire. So actually, ultimately, even then, till the end, he wants to avoid the war. Now here there is very interesting um, exchange between Vidur and Sri Krishna. When Sri Krishna goes to uh, ask Vidur uh, uh, for, uh, for the Shanti, to ask for five villages. So Vidur counsels Krishna, he says, why have you come? Now Vidur is in another strange dilemma. He knows that Dharma is on the side of Pandava. But he also doesn't want the Kuruk empire to be gone. So at one point, he also tries to counsel that, you know, why you are asking all this? It's, it's okay, you know. And that's how we see that Sanjay goes and communicates to the Pandavas that, look here, uh, your, um, he's what, he's Tauji. Uh, he's uh, requesting you that you better take sannyas, leave all this, why you want to fight? And then comes the entire background and then the war develops. So it is a true story of a real war. But here Shubhindu brings out how through war and conflict, just as in individual life, you can't make a progress if you want to close your eyes to war. At some point you have to face the conflict inside squarely. You have to make a choice. If you keep on taking the equestrian position, whatever it is called, it doesn't take us very far. It may steer a uh, you know, it may make you in a kind of, put you in a comfort zone, but not the greatness and glory and nobility and heroism which Mahabharata is about. So we see that uh, war is, uh, Shubhinda speaks about it. One of the places when Shubhinda was asked that, uh, well, sir, now there is peace. This is after the, I think, Second World War, most likely. Yeah, or the First World War. Anyways, he was asked, now there is peace and now we will have the fulfillment of the dream of the new world. He says the new world is not likely to come this way. Most likely it is likely to come through war. Because another aphorism where he says men die so that man may live and God be born. So we have not understood what the, what is the sense of these conflicts in the individual and at a larger scale. This conflict is always invariably between two kinds of forces. One which moves towards the uh, higher forms of life, higher forms of life expression, another which want to pull us back downwards towards a old form. And behind all this, there is on one side the Devas and the other side are the Asuras. Asuras are fighting only for self-aggrandizement, for satisfying their ambition, for position, for crushing those 
the subjects whereas the devas also fight and devas fine to release dharma into a group of humanity they are fighting for that so we see this uh, mahabharata a, a classical tale of the war between no it's not a fratricidal war alone it's not even a war of two civilizations it's one civilization but it is a war where a nation or a civilization has to choose not by a democratic vote because that didn't exist at that time even though they were janpats there was a full fledged proper king and democracy together in india uh, though it was not the way we have assemblies in the greeks if you read indian literature it's so interesting that the people had a say that's why that uh, washerman had a say uh, and ram had to consent because the voice of the people had its own place the final decision had to be made by the king the king could overrun it or the king could keep it that was left to the king to make a choice but the people had their voice they could voice their opinion and they could speak about it they were not stifled as in certain countries and that's what actually in a way world will eventually move towards that but that apart so war is something where we at its root it's a war of idea so idea of a nation in uh, in the light of the way we understand from the indian spiritual point of view that ultimately at the core is dharma so in mahabharat we see many many kind of dilemmas so this is the other aspect of mahabharat that we see many dilemmas which are unique which even today we don't face and yet vyas has solved them by a an understanding of dharma which is too deep and profound and subtle which doesn't fall into a typical rule book of right and wrong for example when draupadi is married to five brothers so on one side it is the dharma to follow uh, your mother's word why it is dharma because well mother is the one you see it was not like today we say oh i don't care whatever the parents are saying now the reason that age it was especially mother's word father's word was not so important right then and then we have several examples where people uh, had problems with what the father had said and they came into conflict nachiketa is one example there are several others but mother's word was important because it was understood that the mother will never give a counsel to a child which would harm him mother is fathers may be blinded by their own ambition and give a counsel not to harm but they may drive the child along paths which are not very uh, healthy though we have of course all kinds of uh, combinations kakasi which was mother of uh, ravana gave him a wrong counsel that he must become dhatiraj but still we see that mothers used to give that so mothers word carried that um, great authority and these pandava brothers they knew that you know their mother is uh, how she has brought them up with such hardship so they have given their mother this place and the when the mother says distribute what you have won equally amongst all of you now it's a great dilemma i don't think that in the entire history of uh, mankind a woman has faced such a dilemma where she is simultaneously married to five men and she could have just said i don't care i'll just go away i'll lead my own life or she could have insisted nobody would have forced her neither yudhishthir nor kunti and yet she chooses that no i'll stay married with these five brothers now comes a very complex tale we see that when they go back this is challenged in the kuru sabha that how can uh, yudhishthir claim to be the claimant higher to a throne when he has married a woman who is married to his four brothers so all these dynamics go in and these subtleties of dharma which of course uh, it's a very vast subject as uh, someone has rightly said are brought out and then again we see that ultimately what does vyas to he brings in as the ultimate authority look here he he never nowhere he says any nowhere he portrays krishna as a you know divine though there is this sense of divinity which runs through oh, except one word when through the characters he describes krishna there is only one place where he uses the word aprameya which means immeasurable that's the only word which conveys all otherwise he doesn't say anything anywhere uh, see those stories of gokul and all are not part of uh, um, 
part of Mahabharata, though they are shown as that. You have Srimad Bhagavat Puran where you find these stories. So there are no mirac- there is no miraculous Krishna there. Krishna is close to human and yet time to time one can sense the Godhead in Vyas Mahabharata. And yet he calls him at one point Aprame. But yet he brings in the Gita. Now surely uh, people often... With regard to Gita, they say that it has been imposed. Now, people say that Vyas Mahabharat, there are different authors. Shubindu agrees that yes, there are different authors. But uh, unlike many uh, Western based scholars who say that ultimately they were just about 8,000 slokas, he says no, they were 24 to 26,000. And then there are others because it's a book of r- roughly 1 lakh slokas. So, he says when you study the style, you can know the difference. And one classic example he gives is of, on one side, when Vyas describes the war and all these, you know, there is a high nobility in Vyas. He doesn't, it's like for Vyas, something like romance is out of question. When you read Vyas, it looks like that. (laughs) Unlike Ramayana, where, you know, you, you feel there is so much in the air which is about love. Vyas doesn't mince words. So, you know, Draupadi gets married in the Swamvar and everybody gets married in the Swamvar. But even Savitri's story, there is very noble and mature story. There is one or two places where we see uh, that there is the Ramayan style. So once the story is Ruru, though there is not so much of romance in it as a sacrifice of love. But the only story where we see a... A touch of romance is in the air and that is the story of Nalanda Mayanti. So we know that in Mahabharata there are several tales. Each tale is a tale of dharma. Savitri is a tale of dharma. There is even the death, the cosmic deities have their dharma. And Savitri has to remind them, teach them what dharma is. Then of course in the tale of Nalanda Mayanti it's all about dharma. Ruru and Pramadva writes about dharma. So from every angle, he has given practically every situation, dilemmas we may face in life. And it's a very complex thing. It's not something as simple. We oversimplify uh, with our, uh, you know, uh, what shall I say, uh, instead of a thought which is all-encompassing, when we have a very linear thought. So we, we have binaries. Karna is uh, good or karna is bad. This is the way of binary thinking where you have a linear thought. That well, injustice was done to him at birth and therefore uh, you sympathize with him. This is not how uh, a man of dharma sees. He doesn't go with that. And we see in uh, Mahabharata several instances where Adhikar Bhed is another very interesting thing in, in the Mahabharata. For instance, the Eklavya story. Now, Eklavya is not a Dalit or, uh, you know, Eklavya is a Kshatriya child. I mean, his father is a... Uh, he is a Senapati. <laughs> I am forgetting which kingdom army. He is a Senapati. He is a Kshatriya. Uh, he wants to now learn. Now, why he can't be taught is not because he is not a Kshatriya. He cannot be taught because Dronacharya very well understands that he has been given the task to train the princes of the Kuru clan. Why? Because Kuru empire must be the greatest. So, he has to be true to his mission. He can't take Karn, he can't take others. It's nothing to do with Karn being born the way we portray all this. It's simply because his task is to ensure that the best, he doesn't want to, supposing for instance, you know, um, a, you know, North Korean president say, says all are equal, uh, I will. I am going to get nuclear technology from anywhere. You will say no, because that's where Adhikar Bhed comes in. So, uh, this was very well understood in ancient India and they kept their interest in mind. So, Dronacharya kept the interest of the Kuru clan. So, he would not teach it to Eklavya, he would not teach it to Karna and he would go out of his way to ensure that the interests of his empire are safeguarded. So, to that extent, it is well within his means and limits to do what he does. Though it is justified in another way also in the Mahabharata because uh, as we know, the the dog is barking. Because it's a hunter dog and it has sense that, sniffed that there is some somebody out there. And it's Eklavya who has put Dronacharya, Pratima and practicing archery. And this dog goes and starts barking. And Eklavya instantly pushes a volley of arrows and stuffs his mouth. And then Dronacharya gives a valid reason. He says, look at this fellow. He's supposed to be a mighty archer. He has no control over himself. He is using all his skills against a helpless dog. Stuffing his mouth with arrows, giving him such a cruel death. What kind of a 
um, you know, warrior he is going to become. So he refuses, not only refuses, he takes away the thumb, which is uh, important. You know, again you see that story takes a very interesting turn of event because the kingdom uh, with to which Eklavya belonged, they go with Duryodhana. Ideally, they should not have stood by Dronacharya. So that was a fight which was of a different nature, where nations were looking for their own um, existence and how to side with different forces. We see the forces same acting in India at this point of time. There are centripetal forces which want to disintegrate. They want a weak king at the to top. They will support him by all the props because this suits their purpose. There are others who have an issue which is about... Uh, they, they don't care about who is at the center, but they are personally against. And therefore, they are personally attacking a, a prime minister because they have an axe to grind. And then there are others who are happy with the idea of a united India. And they want a united India because they feel this is, they identify with uh, Ikshvakus, they identify with the Pandavas and this clan which has always built beautiful empires. So when we look at Mahabharata from that perspective, so all, all that subtlest thing that Vyas has to say, he says it through Sri Krishna in the Gita. Now, of course, Sri Krishna never wrote anything, this for sure. It is the Gita is a verbal document and it has been written by Vyas. Some people say that it has been uh, later on added. But if we look at the Bhagavad Gita, it's very clear, it starts with the description of the battlefield. Several times Sri Krishna reverts back to the scenario in which Arjun is standing. He reverts back again and again that there is a war out there, Arjun. You may die, but better you remember me and die. Either conquer the kingdom nobly, or if you have to perish, perish valiantly. All through, right up to the end, even in that Vishrup Darshan, very clearly, he is showing the warriors which are right out there. They are all going into his mouth and emerging out of him. So we see that the Bhagavad Gita, of course, it's uh, not that Sri Krishna wrote it technically. But whether Vyas documented it, uh, whether Sanjay saw it and uh, you know, whether it was uh, you know, um, uh, written by Lord Ganesh. But one thing is very clear that the Bhagavad Gita is written in the Stress of deep inspiration by none else but Sri Krishna himself. That's how Shivinda puts it. Because if we look at the style is similar. Even in Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna is very different. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't mollycoddle Arjun. He says, Arjun, you are my good friend. You know, if, if it is Ramayana, he will say, Arjun, don't you feel how much I have loved you, how much I have cared for you? That would be Ramayana. Ram is telling to Lakshman, why are you doing this to me at this point of time? Don't you think it is right to do? Nothing. It is typically the way of Vyas. It starts, Sri Krishna starts a volley of literally verbal arrows and each one a choicest word. And the same type of words which we find in Mahabharat where, you know, Draupadi uses against Bhim in Kichaks. You know, Bhim is sleeping nicely when Kichak is trying to uh, outrage her modesty. And Draupadi comes and tells him, you claim that you are a brave man and a courageous man. What use is your courage? You are lying like a log, happy, you have taken food and you are lying on the floor and you think you are brave? Why unto you? I mean, if you read those words, they are enough to shake even a dead man. And here is Bhim, he gets up and the rest is history. This is the way, almost similar. Sri Krishna tells Arjun, he chides him. You are talking, you have become like a Napunsak. What kind of a person you are? Clevium, you are uh, Dorbal, you are weak. What are you doing? And you know, typical way of Vyas, but inspired by Sri Krishna. That's how Shivinda puts it. That when we look at it, Right through and through the way he brings out the deepest profundities of dharma. And that deepest profundity ultimately is that action is the path that man must take and his choices must be based on the way of dharma. Uh, Vivek, can you give me that iPad? So I'll just read a little passage because I can just, I'll forget the time. It is such a fascinating subject with many, many aspects. Um, <laughs> of Mahabharata, but I'll just read something from Sri Aurobindo. Ah, this is so beautiful. 
Now, in the Mahabharata, now he admits that Mahabharata, there have been different writers. He says it doesn't matter because whoever has done the editions are, have done it brilliantly. He says one can see the different styles. So there is the style of Vyas and places there is the Ramayana style. But even that he says that possibly when Vyas was young, so like any youngster he had the romantic vein and so we see the story of Nal and Damianti with the swan going around. He brings it so beautifully. But even if there are many um, places where we see a strong Ramayanic bent or a weak Ramayanic bent, he says it has been done very beautifully because whoever has added has taken the pains to weave it beautifully in the story and therefore he says Ramayana Mahabharata is like a vast cathedral which has been built by many people. So you know it's not like just one authorship. Okay fine there are other authors but each one is embodying some aspect of the Indian soul and to that extent it's wonderful. So there is a mass of writing in which the verse and language is unusually bare, simple and great, full of form and knotted thinking. Now this knotted thinking is the story where uh, Ganesh has to take time to understand what he's writing, what he's speaking. <laughs> that story we all know. So the imagination strong and pure, never florid or richly colored. You see that in Ramayana. Rama is asking every uh, every leaf, where is my Sita? Where is my Sita? Nothing of that kind you will see in Mahabharata. When you know, Draupadi's modesty has been outraged or she has been taken by Jadrath. Uh, it's not, oh Draupadi, where are you? <laughs> the, the Pandu princess go. Heroic. It's all about heroism of a very sublime kind. Humanly heroic, not superhumanly heroic. Humanly heroic. The idea is austere, original, and noble. There is another body of work, sometimes massed together, but far oftener interspersed in the other, which has exactly different qualities. So, this he have already spoken of, but I will just read one passage, paucity of time, so just, and then we can have questions. Uh, okay, so, the Mahabharata is not only the story of the Bharatas, the epic of an early event which had become a national tradition, but on a vast scale the epic of the soul and religious and ethical mind and social and political ideals and culture and life of India. So it embodies, that's why somebody has said not only Mahabharata is the fifth Veda because all the great ideas of the Vedas are there. And uh, that whatever is there in Bharat is there in Mahabharat. And what is not there in, in Mahabharat is not there in Bharat. You can see it as a corollary. So we see it's a beautiful blend. Uh, even those who have contributed have actually enriched it. So it's perfectly fine. Um, the Mahabharat is the creation and expression, not of a single individual mind, but of the mind of a nation. It is a poem of itself written by a whole people. See, when I went recently to Barcelona, I saw that wonderful, you know, cathedral being built by uh, different doors and it's so wonderful, you know. But this, though there is one person who is behind it, but several hands have gone into building it. So, that's how Mahabharata is. It's, it's the voice of soul of the soul of India. It is the poem of itself written by a whole people. And personally, if you ask me, whether you make Gita compulsory or not, that's a different thing. But every Indian should learn, read Mahabharata. It's a story which is about us. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It's irrelevant. It's the story of a people, of a nation, how it thought, how it felt, how it chose, how it acted in a moment. You know, it's its, its soul. We'll get connected with its soul. I mean, that's how I look at it and uh, that's the effect at least Mahabharata had on me. Thanks to reading Mahabharata at a very young age, I could never identify with film heroes or sports people as my... Uh, you know, <laughs> ideals. It was very clear. Ideal to Arjun. <laughs> Ideal is Arjun and God is Krishna. All other things like, you know, uh, they pale into insignificance. This idea of being in rags and taking sannyas. After seeing Krishna on the battlefield, who would ever choose that ideal and uh, how beautifully brings out about tyag, sannyas. Of course, Gita is a vast subject and it's in the... And we see Siddhi Day, you know, this is exactly what Sri Aurobindo did. He established once again the idea of an undivided India, 
we just talk about india and you know uh, the map which is made in the ashram playground is the map of an united india which always existed incidentally it has always existed and this map was made in 1954 after the partition because this is the map of true india akhand bharat is not something which you know uh, we can debate or discuss that's a different thing it is the soul of a nation you can't dismember a body which it is lived together there are formations there are energy is released in these areas so mahabharata is the creation and expression not of a single individual but the mind of a nation it's the poem of itself written by a whole people it would be vain to apply to it the canons of a poetical art applicable to an epic poem with a smaller and more restricted purpose the whole poem now look at this wonderful line the whole poem has been built like a vast national temple unrolling slowly its immense and complex idea from chamber to chamber there several mini stories it just unimaginable if one just reads the stories which are of shoots in the mahabharata one would be richly rewarded every time you just the same thing is followed in ramayana but much more in mahabharata every time they go to an ashram see how these ashrams used to teach they didn't charge money and give you a technique this is wow a story and through the story they gave what they had to say something so amazing we know savitri is there in um, part of uh, yudhishthir's rendezvous with um, markande the whole poem has been built like a vast national temple unrolling slowly its immense and complex idea from chamber to chamber crowded with significant groups and sculptures and inscriptions the grouped figures carved in divine or semi divine proportions a humanity aggrandized and half lifted uplifted to super humanity and yet always true to the human motive and idea and feeling that's where he tempers the strain of the real constantly raised by the tones of the ideal the life of this world amply portrayed but subjected to the conscious influence and presence of the parts of the worlds behind it so you don't have like in ramayana you have all the navagrahas who have been captured the triloka adipati no but you have arjun who is the uh, ansh of indra you have karna who is the ansh of surya so all these aspects are there that there are the godhead the cosmic forces which are behind these agencies that is there even the demons you have an auger baka what what was that fellow who was um, killed by bhim anyways whatever it is doesn't matter <laughs> he is more about his appetite he is an auger he is not uh, not like you know when you look at the fellows in 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 ravana's time ahi ravan they are terrible life mean, you can't imagine <laughs> but they are more at that level so always there is that sense of the real so he wouldn't create a character which is uh, which goes beyond the pale of our human imagination that's why for the modern mind mahabharata is more appealing while ramayana is more uh, those who have a psychic turn if those who feel from the heart they find it very appealing but mahabharata appeals to the modern mind because it is the characters even in their super humanity are human true to the human aim and the whole uplifted by a long embodied procession of a consistent idea worked out in the wide steps of the poetic story so this idea of course we know uh, shubhendra brings out at the same time though supremely interesting in substance and vivid in the manner of the telling as a poetic story it is something more a significant tale itihas representative throughout of the central ideas and ideals of indian life and culture so what is that one word which describes indian life and culture here he says the leading motive is the indian idea of the dharma india never fought a religious war this concept is an anathema because it's not about religion ravan is of the same religion he is a brahmin by birth to to boot it comes from a lineage of pulastrishi who is brahma's lineage his co brothers are kuber and uh, co brother no cousins uh, narad who is his grandfather or chacha or something like that you know he comes from that lineage but the fellow must go <laughs> it doesn't matter why because he is representing a dharma 
and more so because he is mighty he is a knowledgeable person and yet he falls in lust for a woman who is helplessly in a forest this is not acceptable so we see in both the stories feminine figures become important to topple an empire here ravana has done many misdeeds this is not the first time but then here he crossed all limits he goes to a forest where there is a lady in the hermitage who is unarmed her husbands are not her husband is not there her nobody there to protect and ravana kidnaps her takes her by force this is not acceptable this starts the downfall of the empire of ravan and there again we see draupadi is dragged to the kuru sabha some people say it is not portrayed it is there of course maybe different authors so she is dragged to the court and this event mark the downfall of the kuru empire so we see the power of the feminine who stands behind all these pandavas holding them together because draupadi is conscious of a mission she is not on a personal uh, happiness journey no i want only arjuna i want to be married and happily satisfied this idea is an anathema to the indian mind it's not for personal pleasure or joys of the flesh it is for the glory and greatness of the spirit that the indian thought has lived and that we see in ramayana and the mahabharata none of the characters sita is not saying oh i had a comfortable life in the palace why are you sending me away it that's not the issue at all the issue can be dharma debate can be over dharma not over personal happiness seeking of comfort that we see how when they are abandoned to the forest these pandavas how they go they are purified by that ordeal so we see constantly this idea of dharma and dharma in the indian context is not a rule book it is not about moral ideas of right and wrong because there are many gray shades and we have to make critical choices and that's where the choices are made the leading motive is the indian idea of the dharma here the vedic notion of the struggle between the godheads of truth and light and unity and the powers of darkness and division and falsehood is brought out from the spiritual and religious and internal into the outer intellectual ethical and vital plane so there are human representatives you just can't just internalize them that all war is inside this is a neat way of finishing it off it is inside no doubt about it you have to conquer hatred and anger inside but it is also outside because they are representatives of our dharma and you have to meet them tackle them take the challenge of life and if necessary you know they must pass out of existence so this is here uh, so there are those who are embodying the greater ethical ideals of the indian dharma and others who are embodiments of asuric egoism and self will and misuse of misuse of the dharma the political a battle in which the personal struggle culminates an international clash ending in the establishment of a new rule of righteousness and justice a kingdom or rather an empire of the dharma uniting warring races and substituting for the ambitious arrogance of kings and aristocratic clans the supremacy the calm and peace of a just and humane empire it is the old struggle of the asura deva and asura god and titan this the way in which this double form is worked out and the presentation of the movement of individual lives and of the national life first as their background and then as coming into the front in a movement of kingdoms and armies and nations show a high architectonic faculty akin in the sphere of poetry to that which labored in indian architecture so we see that uh, now we we can because you know we can have questions i am fine with it but to close that look how sure window even if we forget everything else logical continuation of the work of the avatars parshuram finishes the haya kingdom when you know the empire has gone ori and it has forgotten the path of dharma we see ram once again builds an empire based on dharma demolishing the forces which are of a dharma we see shri krishna once again defeating the forces of retrogression paritranaya sadhuna vinashaya chudushkta dharma sansthapana thai sambhavami yogi yogi and once again securing bharatvarsh which for 3500 years continues to be safeguarded you see there were foreign attacks during that time kal yavan who is kal yavan but one of those uh, greek iranian whatever side we may say so probably a greek and he was the one who had attacked so there were foreign powers which had entered and yet 
because of Sri Krishna's teaching and because of you know establishing the rule of dharma, we see that all these forces were repelled and kept at abeyance for almost three thousand years. But then slowly the dharma fades, dharma siglani, and then we see a series of invasions, and the last of uh, bit of the power of Krishna we see embodied in Rani Lakshmi Bai of Chhansi, and then a long lull when suddenly everybody is sleeping supplicating, to placate, asking, begging for independence and then once again we see like the phoenix, Sri Krishna rises again. <laughs> Returns again, 1905 with Sri declaring about Poon Swaraj, complete independence, brings life into a sleeping nation, establishes the soul of India and then he once again unarmed, sitting in his room, fights the great battle of the modern Kurukshetra, which was the second great war. So if you look at it and all through, you know, we see Sri again, one of his dream is the dream of a united India, which is exactly what Sri Krishna did establish at that point of time. And then of course, there is the other aspect, the dream of a united world that was still not at that point of time in consideration. So all these things are, we can see Sri logically continuing Sri Krishna's work. And is it then little wonder that Sri Krishna chose to unite with Sri Aurobindo, which is the event we celebrate on Siddhi Day, when Sri Krishna, the personality of the avatar Sri Krishna, has come and fused with Sri Aurobindo, literally saying, now the age that is dawning is yours. Lead it, give the new Yuga Dharma of the age, give the new Gita and the Yuga Dharma was the spiritual and supramental transformation the age of integration where matter and spirit must integrate synthesize this is the new Yuga Dharma and the new gospel he gave in place of the Gita is Savitri Namaste uh, I'm sorry this has gone way beyond what I had uh, I think I had to restrain myself because it's a vast subject. But if there are any questions, I am always happy to take it. Thank you, Alaji. Um, one question, I think he is a high schooler. Why did Abhimanyu and Uttara's unborn son had to bear wrath of Brahmastra when the child yeah. was still in womb and couldn't have been carrying such intense bad karma from past life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this question uh, about Abhimanyu and Parikshit. So uh, leave aside the bad karma. This is not in Indian thought. This bad karma, good karma has come much later. The theory of karma is very different. It's an evolutionary mechanism. And it's not about justice. It's about justice is there, but it's a very subordinate element. The main purport of karma theory is evolution through the choices we make. Uh, and this applies as much in everyday life, you don't have to bring in even the divine element. Your choices will either help you evolve towards a greater uh, state or they put us down. And this regardless of, you may get outer success by a certain kind of uh, action and choice, but inwardly we may be impoverished. So karma is about that, it's a big subject, so I am not touching upon that. But Abhimanyu, now you look at Abhimanyu, it's so interesting. Uh, imagine Abhimanyu not dying the way he died. You know, paradox is we won't even remember him. So, Abhimanyu's life typifies what Shore is. See, there is a term in Indian thought which is called Veer. So, Veer comes from Veerya. Veerya is spiritual energy. Now, you see, warriors can be skillful. There are many skillful warriors on both sides. So, um, you know, they are swift, they are bold, they are... All, all these qualities are there. So that's like technique. They, they know the technique and the technology. And they also have the psychological making of a warrior. But there is something which Abhimanyu brings out which is missing in almost all the warriors. And that is the energy of the soul. So when Arjun goes for a sacrifice, even till uh, Abhimanyu goes for a sacrifice, even till today in, in the Indian war, you see that young... Uh, uh, Arun Khetrapal, he died just a young age of 21 or more recently Vikram Batra. Why do we celebrate it? You know, by dying they became immortal. This is a curve of destiny which a certain soul chooses. 
it's actually a leap if abhimanyu would have uh, said yeah i know i can't actually break the uh, i can't return back tau ji would you come along with me abhimanyu is there is no glory of abhimanyu so these were people who lived for glory and they died for glory see did the geeta this what shri krishna tells arjuna either you conquer and enjoy the kingdom but conquer it justly or if you have to fall fall nobly protecting the people but don't run away from this battle of life so abhimanyu typifies that door of glory which souls choose and in the indian context uh, we don't look at the life of one body or one form so we always believe that those who die fighting for truth and justice and right uh, for them the doors of heaven open so this is a way of saying that well they meet the they meet glory and they Uh, take another life we had now it's there many aspects to it but again i am restraining myself then the second aspect is parikshit see it's very interesting the pandavas five pandavas and parikshit you know what is unique about them uh, of course it included karna also but karna lost that chance that none of them is a human birth you see it's interesting <laughs> you see in christianity we have the conception of virgin birth buddha virgin birth so this idea was that these are forces of a new order they are forces that have not yet manifested upon earth so the six pandavas represent the new kind of forces they are not born in the normal human way i mean there is a physical process no doubt about it but there are forces of other being realms which have come what about parikshit now look at the story parikshit is destroyed in the womb but parikshit is revived by krishna so if you see parikshit himself becomes a child of the new consciousness he is born embodying the consciousness of krishna actually krishna has given him life so he becomes literally the child of krishna who becomes the ruler of the uh, future indian nation so it's a very very beautiful story uh, very significant very symbolic it's not about bad karma if anything it's about the good karma to die to your old consciousness and be born as krishna's child is something which <laughs> i am sure one would covet very much or to die a glorious death like abhimanyu defending uh, truth and justice against uh, the champions of unrighteousness is something very beautiful to a warrior soul it's something very beautiful yes next question vivek ji yeah i uh, said mm-hmm. slightly humorous but i'll just ask anyway mm-hmm. uh, ravi is asking and duryodhana earned a place in heaven too after the war is it yeah 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 true true so that's another thing that duryodhana also earned a place in heaven so earning a place in heaven was never considered something great in indian thought so they heaven was like one of like you can build a very nice house wonderful house so you have earned a place in heaven so but the story explains what the why duryodhana earned the place in heaven that there in the story so none of us is completely black or white this binary doesn't exist there are sheets of gray so duryodhana also has sheets of gray what is the gray side of duryodhana he has he is ambitious he is uh, you know uh, terribly ambitious power hungry but there are some very good things about duryodhana duryodhana is shown as he lust after power but he doesn't lust after women even though that's that place where he calls for drop these this thing but more importantly the one quality good uh, good quality about duryodhana is that he wants to fight and then he wins so he has courage inside him he doesn't run away from a battle time to time he is shown when the enemy is like much beyond his reckoning but he doesn't want to run away from uh, from the war field uh, unlike uh, shakuni's counsel and the ways of shakuni he succumbed to it but there were some good elements inside him and it is to these elements that they go after death into a um uh, you know that higher world so this we can well understand if we read um, yog vasisht where we see that the same person is simultaneously experiencing hell simultaneously experiencing heaven that part which was ambitious lustful greedy that goes into the dark world that part everybody has a little beautiful side that goes in heaven for a while but heaven is not a big deal you return back so in indian thought it was never going into heaven was considered great even the geeta mentions that that those who seek after their desires they go to heavens assisted by the gods but then there are the great ones who seek after liberation they seek after moksha moksha not about other worldly moksha but freedom from ignorance so that was the idea so it's okay let him rest in heaven 
he missed the opportunity of being an instrument of the divine which is a great loss <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah next question is from prashanta uh, in both mahabharat and ramayan it is the woman who might have lost the most for example sita draupadi kunti gandhari etc is there any significance of this in your opinion uh no they didn't lose see that's the beauty first i'll come to ramayana where we see extreme see look at the beauty of the poet imagine uh, of course i know that uttarakhand is a debatable thing actually it is debatable because there are elements in uttarakhand which it is there now as we have received valmiki ramayan it is not called as uttarakhand is the seventh book but definitely when we read there is an uneven passages and it doesn't um Uh, doesn't uh, you know feel like the rest of ramayana the character of rama also doesn't go with the rest of what is there in ramayana but that apart but actually if you look at it from another perspective what is sita imagine if sita would not have gone through what she went through would what would have happened to the feminine character i find something very amazing about this aspect that if sita was not abandoned if she didn't go through that agni pariksha or stay with you know in that place with all this hardship this ramayana would have been a one sided story of ram just a, honestly it would have been then a very male dominated story but it has become a sitayan simply because sita is the epitome of a woman who even when abandoned by the husband whatever be the you know just cause and all i have spoken about it that there was a reason rajdharm let's leave it aside let's say that she is abandoned now what is a woman who is abandoned do she could have gone and gathered the kings to protect her got married uh, tried to attack uh, ram uh, thrown calumny against him she does none of them she goes to ashram delivers her children those two children grow up into jewels marvelous children single handedly they don't carry a single bitterness about their father in fact they have heard only beautiful things about their father that's how they recount ramayan in the court of ram so they look at sita she brings them up together not for once even when later on they say no no you please come back she lives with her self respect and dignity so i think sita's character has been ennobled through that she is not a weak woman she is not see suffering rama also suffered if you see suffering uh, pandava suffered suffering is not something that indian mind tried to escape from but suffering was the test which steeled or purified the gold i think to say that only draupadi suffered and pandavas didn't suffer would be uh, quite an exaggeration they both suffered but both of them draupadi and kunti on one side and pandavas on the other side they turned their suffering into a test of fire and they brought out the best out of it that's what is the greatness of draupadi and that's how we see just uh, one one more sentence that see the story of draupadi is epitomized when yudhishthir goes and asks uh, markande he says has there ever been a woman more noble and chaste and yet who has suffered so much as draupadi because he is weighing in his mind about the humiliation and then markande says yes savitri who suffered and conquered an adverse fate so nal tamanti all these stories man and woman both suffered if you see but the thing is what they made out of suffering is the issue indian mind didn't shrink from suffering it didn't invite suffering either it didn't love suffering it didn't shrink from suffering but when suffering came it took it as a means to purify and the best came out of it that's what draupadi and sita is about thank you um another question is from devend bhai um devend patel that he want to ask you about akhand bharat yes it's it's akhand bharat to to me i have spoken about it even there is a probably a separate talk on youtube uh, i'm sure uh, by the name of akhand bharat where i have tried in de- details what is akhand bharat it's not a modern thing it is not a creation of modern mind akhand bharat has existed in the conception of the rishis all the if you join the 51 parts of sati all around you will have a kand bharat it's a spiritual conception india is not a material land it is a spiritual uh, conception and the land has over a period of time through the flux and flow of time eventually it has undergone several changes names have changed kings have changed much upheaval has taken place but india actually the world if you see from savitri point of view uh, this world is a conception spiritual conception 
So, same thing with India and India, I'm sure it is true of all nations. So, but I'm focusing right now on India, that India is a spiritual conception, it's a Yagya Vedi, meant for the good of the world. And Akhand Bharat is not a requirement for just some vociferous Indians who love India sentimentally. Uh, no, Akhand Bharat is necessary for the world. And just as the mother once remarked that the sooner you build Matri Mandir, the better it is for Auroville. Let me say this very prophetically, that the sooner we have Akhand Bharat, the better it is for the good of the world. The more we delay it under any kind of, you know, uh, molly coddling and uh, looking good and appearing good, the more we are delaying the good of the world. And it's obvious if we look at the political scenario. Don't we see what is happening in that portion of Akhand Bharat, which has been done khand? It has become the hub of all that could be done. It's like a limb becoming gangrenous. Even the other limb, Bangladesh, Myanmar, look at what is happening. It's becoming gangrenous. And okay, we may have a dismembered uh, India, but it's dismembered India is not good for the world. Because if there is a light which can rescue the world out of its present state, it is India. And this I can say without a doubt and, you know, the facts are there to see it. Where do we find hope? Yeah. Namaskar. Namaskar. I, I have a 100% faith that whatever Sri Almindo and Mataji said, but the way things are running right now, look at the Muslims are this want to integrate India. Plus the Pakistan and Bangladesh and Afghanistan. Do you oh. how are you gonna take, conquer take, this? Take take this? take another prophecy. They are hurtling toward their doom. This is the path that will only accelerate their disintegration because the world recoils very badly. And it is already beginning to recoil. And if those who are trying to disintegrate India and the world by these means, if they don't see the writing on the wall, it is going to hit back very badly. Because already the recoil has begun. 20 years back, it may have been said that, you know, they are doing menacing. But the world is beginning to recoil because there is something like the world soul. It won't accept this for long. There is enough manhood and enough humanity and heroism and chivalry still in the world. Enough goodness that it will not accept. See, politics is the last thing to change. But the average human beings are beginning to see through the game, not only in India, but all over. And this game won't last long. This is the way they are hurtling toward their dome. Uh, maybe 20 years, 30 years. So the next question is, I think you have uh, covered a few of them, but I'll just ask the question if you want to add something. The force is by Bernie. The force that exists in India also exists throughout the world. Is there any hope for the world to coexist or are we destined for World War III? I, I don't see a World War III. I see massive conflicts brewing in several areas uh, because, as I said, war, unfortunately, is the uh, mother of uh, father, not mother, Heraclitus said it's the father of uh, things. So uh, there will be many conflicts in different parts of the world uh, for the simple reason that, you know, we are holding on to our fixed positions. But this conflict is likely to take two forms. Uh, one is the conflict of nations. This is not going to be the common one. The more common conflict will be within the people of a nation and the political system. This is the new war, if you like to call it. And uh, it has begun. And it will upset many a nations, probably weaken them, strengthen them. Nations have to go through this till ultimately they recover their lost soul. So it's a part of the process, uh, these uh, kind of, uh, and they may take the form of, uh, you know, civil wars, not so much wars the way we understand. But this is part of the process, but not third world war in the way, uh, say, the second world war or the first world war took place, certainly not. Thank you. World, World conditions, conditions won't allow it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank. Next question from Shivali. Um, Yudhisthir said to be embodiment of dharma, but it is Yudhisthir that gets into game dice. Yes. What can be the significance in the portrayal of the character this way? Yes. So very beautiful. So dharma there. As I said, dharma is a thing which is very subtle, and in Mahabharata, several places we see this dilemma coming up. Now, with Yudhishthir's case, on one side, as a king, he is not supposed to refuse a challenge. 
even if it's a game of dice see that is the paradox uh, if a kshatriya is called and a king particularly with a neighboring kingdom that's how null loses all his uh, wealth so if he is invited or invited to a challenge game is a challenge he can't say no because he is shrinking from his kshatriya duty so to that extent he is going for they didn't see as good or bad it was a challenge so he goes for that challenge which he takes up and um, to that extent it was okay but that's where the story shows that if when you know it's like bhishma and dronacharya they have chosen to be uh, with their own people that there is a higher dharma a higher standard which you must resort to when there are conflicts so here on one side he is supposed to not leave the game when he is losing you can't just do that so he keeps on you know putting things on stake and there his mind is possessed obviously uh, even a man of a very uh, shubindu had a very interesting answer to this when somebody who had practiced mental control for decades suddenly you know lost it and went away so shubindu said somebody asked how could it it happen he said haven't you known yudhishthir case so a satvik man yudhishthir is a satvik man satvik man is not a spiritual man satvik man lives by dharma but his control is not absolute so at there is definitely a moment when yudhishthir completely lost uh, that satvik uh, impulse because he was so much overtaken by rachas and at that point of time he makes the blunder the blunder is not on just about putting draupadi at stake you can't put even your kingdom at stake because it's not your kingdom Uh, actually in the deepest sense according to dharma you can't even put yourself at stake you can put your outer possessions at stake so yudhishthir so that story typifies that even a man as great and as dharmnist in fact more so because for a dharmnist to make one error can cost him very heavy whereas ordinary human beings there is a great allowance given by nature but again as i said yudhishthir gets purified by the struggle it all works out for good because tomorrow yudhishthir uh, in the ways of destiny yudhishthir will be coronated as the emperor and destiny knows it so destiny must prepare him for becoming the raja who upholds dharma so he goes through all the dilemmas of dharma even during one vas one parv he is asked questions by the yaksha to ensure who is none else but his father yaksh he, he comes as yaksh to make sure that yudhishthir understand dharma so then he is equipped to become the king emperor that's why shri krishna does not that time incite them to fight they could have won had they come to fight that time with the entire yadu clan along with their side but at that point of time he doesn't because he has to be purified go through the ordeal so that story typifies that yes thank you alok ji i think uh, that can... can i ask a last question please sure please yes okay. thank you yes. so much yeah dear alok thank you so much for this beautiful beautiful uh, lecture and um, all so helpful with so many ways i reminded uh, mother said that there's only one country needed to stand up for the, the truth do you think that's going to be india and do you think we will see that in this life or sure in life to come how do you see that yes so sure bindu said that that for this chaturyug that is the this uh, uh, four um, four ages form a cycle uh, this is the seventh one so he says that for this uh, cycle of creation india is the chosen country it's not that it is every cycle in every age but for this cycle india has been the chosen country to uphold the highest values for mankind and eventually uh, bring it out and i take i have a very simple take on it apart from i could discuss the geopolitical scenario but to take it in a very simple way that since such has been the decree it will happen because all else can happen but divine will eventually will fulfill itself so i do trust the divine will that if uh, shubindra said this in yoga and its objects that for this chatur yug it is krishna it is india which has been the divinely chosen country so what divine has chosen whatever may be the difficulties challenges we can see it in 70 years the way india bounced back and is beginning to uh, show those signs early signs of uh, you know recovering its lost you know um, truth i won't use the word glory and greatness because they have different connotations it's lost truth and just a matter of time it has to rise for the good of the world and it will be so sooner rather than later let me add to that <laughs> thank you yeah so 
anyone else if have a question we can ask otherwise thank you very much alok ji i think it was a great uh, way to learn mahabharat from sri aurobindo's point of view and and really have a different uh, view of the political uh, landscape of the india how it all happened um just to note for all of us we may again have an opportunity to listen to alok ji on 1st january so please wait for the invite thank you very much Thank you thank you so much